do a lot of waiting, waiting for a test to come back, waiting for a quarantine period to end. In a sense, some of these uh, experiences of waiting uh, help to reinforce in us the waiting that we should be doing uh, for the coming of Christ. And for us, the, the waiting is much more than simply marking the passage of time or filling a 14-day quarantine period, but rather that waiting is also filled with preparing and getting ready for the, uh, the coming of our Lord. As, uh, as Catholics, as, as Christians, um, that coming is a lot more than uh, grabbing paper and Christmas lights and uh, parties. It's really uh, the preparation of our, our souls, a preparation through uh, some form of uh, self-denial, not to the same degree as, as in Lent necessarily, but, it, but at least uh, reinforcing that uh, that notion of expecting, of looking forward to something. And it's also an opportunity to prepare, uh, to root out any of those faults which may make us less suitable to receive our Lord. Our, our society uh, certainly is, is not in a, a mode of waiting for Christ or even looking for Christ. That's one of the challenges that we have as, as Catholics in the world, and particularly in the medical world, is that our, uh, what we bring to the world is something that the world doesn't even know that it's looking for, even though it so desperately needs it. So our, our challenge is to bring, the, uh, bring our faith into our own lives, and then into the lives of our patients and into our communities. And we do that in each of the patient contacts we have every day. We do that uh, in a special way when our patients give us the opportunity uh, to witness in some particular way. Um, and we do it uh, to the community when we address questions of, of faith and the intersection of faith and medicine. And we'll talk a little later on tonight about uh, one of those issues in terms of the, the ethical uh, considerations involved in a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, the uh, season of Advent is uh, full of feasts and near feasts. Um, so while we may be somewhat uh, penitential and reserved, we have plenty of opportunities to, to let the joy of our faith break through. Uh, most uh, immediately we have uh, next week the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, the patroness of our country, and we are certainly in a period of time where our country needs to turn again to our, our patroness. So that in a special way, I would ask each of you to, as we celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, to keep our nation in mind. Our Lady Guadalupe comes a few days later on the 12th, and she is the uh, patroness of the unborn, the patroness of the Americas. Um, again, um, a tremendous uh, intercessor in the cause of the unborn, which is going to be more and more uh, an issue over the next few years. Um, actually, tomorrow is St. Francis Xavier, a, a great missionary, recalling again our own vocation as, as missionaries. When we were baptized, we were commissioned to spread the faith, and there are particular ways each of us is called to do that. We have, uh, I could go through the entire church calendar, but that would, uh, I think you can each look at your Magnificat or somewhere else. Was that St. Nicholas on Sunday, although technically because it's the sun, second Sunday in Advent, he gets the friends for St. Nicholas. Um, but the, um, the week between Christmas and New Year's uh, is a, uh, a, a special week in the church. Uh, you have the Feast of St. Stephen, the Feast of uh, St. John the Apostle, the Feast of the Holy Family, uh, the Feast of uh, the Holy Innocence, 
on this back end, uh, say semester or early fall. Uh, so we uh, we have a lot uh, coming in this month that reminds us of our history, but also of our mission. And we ask each of you to reflect as you prepare for Advent, to reflect on uh, all of those who have come before us, and reflect on our call to imitate them and to carry the faith out into the world. One of the uh, challenges that we're facing uh, is COVID-19. In case anybody hasn't recognized that we're, we have a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, this has caused tremendous disruption uh, in, in the lives of, of our patients, of our practices, of our communities, and in our nation. And it's, well, some people look at COVID as a, uh, a punishment from God. Uh, we certainly uh, can pray that whatever this is, whether it's a chastisement or a natural consequence or just a, a remote consequence of the evil in the garden, whatever it is, we can certainly pray for it to be ended. Um, it would be great if God would miraculously make it go away tomorrow. It may not do that, or he may not do that, but he may instead be giving us the means to make it go away more gradually. Um, and by doing so, or by using our own natural skills and our ability to collaborate um, together to, to help to uh, rid the, the country of this scourge. And that's where immunization comes in. Uh, immunization may be one of the tools that will help to uh, reduce the threat of this disease. Immunization is not going to be an immediate uh, cure. Uh, it won't stop the, the disease in its tracks. There are still questions about the long-term effectiveness of immunization. Um, there are questions about how, how much it will be uh, taken up, that is, some people are still hesitant about um, taking on a, a new vaccine. Um, so even if we have 100% acceptance, we don't have 100% effectiveness in the vaccine, we don't have the assurance of permanent immunity. So the, the disease may still be with us, but the vaccine should be able to modify it in some way. So vaccination, uh, I think it's going to be an important uh, part of our returning to some semblance of, of normal life. It's something that is um, uh, likely to be available very soon. It's going to take a while for it to be as widely available in the numbers that it needs to completely control the disease. But we're going to be seeing delivery and uh, use of the vaccine very quickly. Is that Parker, maybe? I don't know. Who's doing it? PMK. R. Welcome. That's actually my wife. Who is that? This is Jim. Jim Kaiser. Jim Kaiser. Mm hmm Okay, great. The, the ID there is my wife. She's due back, I hope soon. So I, I'm. Tr she wanted to attend, and um, so I. You want me to? You want to see me? Oh, just it doesn't matter. But I'll I'll wait until she comes back because I'm going to turn it over to her if she gets here soon. Great. Okay. So yeah, John was just talking about the immunization and then, you know, the potential help for the vaccines and things. And we are recording this, um, so it'll be available. I don't know where you can put it on your website. Uh, put a link on our website to say, you know, to see our discussion on vaccines, we could do that. So one of the, one of the issues that comes up with a, a vaccination like this is who gets it? How do we distribute it? 
And uh, it looks like the uh, distribution priorities are going to be healthcare workers who are in the greatest uh, positions of danger, and then those who are at highest risk to the in the community, whether it's people in long-term care facilities, people with uh, comorbidities, uh, with other serious health conditions. And that makes sense to prioritize the people who would most benefit from the vaccine. Um, the uh, vaccination of healthcare workers um, makes sense because uh, healthcare workers are a scarce resource in our fight against the serious complications of the disease. So I think there's, there seems to be less debate about who gets the vaccine at this point. Uh, there is a, uh, a more important debate from the, uh, the Catholic uh, ethical standpoint uh, relating to the fetal tissue uh, sources that are used in some of the vaccine uh, manufacturers. And this goes back to an issue that uh, predates uh, COVID vaccination. In fact, uh, the issue uh, is, is one that's been well, uh, well studied for several of the vaccines that we normally use. Uh, the, the MMR, the hepatitis A, the chicken pox, uh, some of the rabies and some of the polio vaccines are among those that in their manufacturing process, use a cell line that's de uh, derived from an aborted fetus. The, uh, the abortion that caused this particular cell line uh, to, to be developed occurred in Sweden back in the 1960s. So it's not something that happened recently, um, but the uh, the cells from that aborted uh, baby were specially treated in such a way that they became uh, what the scientists call immortal. Um, and we know that that's a, that's a different connotation in the spiritual sense, but uh, at least it's that these cells can continue to propagate without um, naturally uh, dying and degrading the way typical cells do. So these cells are useful in uh, providing a standard platform uh, for, for testing and for other uh, purposes and for growing, growing viruses. To grow a virus, you need a uh, you need cells for it to live in. So one source of these cells is this aborted cell line. Other cell line or other processes use cells derived from uh, mice or monkeys or other animal models. And there are some processes which are looking at using human stem cells that are not derived from aborted uh, fetuses that uh, could also provide the same function. In any event, the, the question is raised. Uh, if I use one of these vaccines that is derived from an aborted, uh, that uses cells in the manufacturing process derived from an abortion, am I somehow cooperating in the abortion? And they, uh, when we look at the principle of cooperation, first, um, the, it is never good to cooperate with evil or to be involved with evil. It is sometimes necessary in this fallen world, it is almost impossible not to at least in some way touch or come in contact with things that are tainted by evil. So the, the ethical principles of cooperation govern how close can you get and still be, uh, still not be tainted by that, that evil. One distinction is, did you intend or do you intend for that evil to occur? And that is what we call formal cooperation. So if you intend to be part of that evil or you intend for that evil to occur, if the nurse is handing the 
abortion instruments to the doctor and thinks this is a good thing that I'm doing, I'm helping to do an abortion. That's formal cooperation, and that is never permitted. Formal cooperation is as simple as doing the act itself because it, uh, it unites you very closely to the intent of the act. So in these instances, and using vaccine uh, derived from tissue, derived from aborted fetus, generally we're not formally cooperating because the abortion happened many years ago and we're not in any way approving or intending that that abortion uh, takes place. So we get into the realm of what's called material cooperation. Material cooperation occurs when you uh, do not intend that the evil occurs, but you somehow furnish something that is either necessary or in some way assists in the performance of that evil act. Material cooperation can be um, immediate, that is, it's very close to the act, it assists in the act itself. There's no distance between you. Or it can be uh, remote. Now the, the cooperation that is uh, immediate, that is uh, very closely connected to the act, becomes sinful itself because you're actually assisting or providing something that's necessary for the performance of the act. On the other side, if you're uh, some distance away from the act, but still providing something that, that may approve of the act or may uh, assist in the act even after the fact, um, or be somehow involved in it, then you uh, are involved in what we call remote material cooperation. Remote material cooperation may be permissible for a serious reason. And in this situation, we have to look at why is it that we're taking the vaccine? And if it's if there's a serious reason to take a vaccine, prevent a, what could be a serious disease, and if the uh, cooperation is sufficiently remote, um, then it's permissible. The closer you are to the act, the more serious the, decision, the, the reason must be to permit your cooperation. In, in the situation of uh, the vaccines that I mentioned before, the measles, or, or the mumps, the chicken pox, I know actually it's not mumps, it's rubella, but it's combined with the animal. So the rubella vaccine, the chicken pox, the hepatitis A, et cetera. Um, the, the need to protect against the, uh, uh, the disease is important enough, and there is uh, a, only a very remote connection between your taking the vaccine and the, uh, uh, the performance of the abortion. And the one other uh, point to remember is that even if you're engaging in a permissible degree of material cooperation, you still are not permitted to do it if it would cause scandal. If taking an MMR vaccine would cause people to think, therefore, that you approve of abortion, then you ought not to do it. Generally, that's not the case. Um, here in the, uh, oh, in the, one other condition would be that if you are going to engage in an act of remote material cooperation, there can't be another way to accomplish the same end. That is, if you had two vaccines that both protected against mumps or rubella, uh, then taking the objectionable MMR would not be permitted if you had an MMR that was grown on uh, non-human cells. And, and here is where we get into one of the difficulties with the COVID vaccines. And that is that there are 
There are many vaccines being developed. Many companies are out there working furiously, and we've had news reports of some vaccines that have very good uh, uh, success rates and which, uh, which appear to be um, not only effective, but, but safe in the early trials. The, the question comes, are there, uh, are there suitable alternatives for these? The, the two vaccines that have both uh, gotten closest to authorization, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, do not use fetal tissue in their manufacturing process themselves. The AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the Johnson Johnson vaccine, some of the other vaccines that are being uh, developed uh, do use uh, objectionable tissue. So it is uh, it's important to draw those distinctions. If we do look at the, the two vaccines that are closest to being released, the Moderna and the um, uh, Pfizer vaccines, they're not completely ethically clean because in one portion of the testing process, they did use these cells that have an objectionable source. At least what I have looked at ethically, uh, the uh, people looking at this had, had, had the opinion that uh, this is a sufficiently minor part of the, uh, the process and not a central part of making the vaccines. So that it probably doesn't disqualify these vaccines, whereas those vaccines that are grown and uh, developed themselves on the um, fetal tissue cell lines probably are more objectionable. So what do you do? If, uh, as we uh, got emails today saying uh, at some sometime in the near future they're going to send you an email doctor and say uh, it's your turn to get vaccinated. Well, I'm just all good now. And you're good. Yeah, there you so, go. I guess this is <laughs> um, so what do you do? You, uh, if uh, if it's important enough to be vaccinated at this time. And if the only vaccine available in the area, because as I understand, the distribution is going to be uh, area wide, and it may be that this whole section of northern Indiana may only get one. Which one are you? Um, at this point, it will probably be either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, both of which would probably be uh, ethically permissible. Um, but if they, if they uh, give you the opportunity to have the vaccine right now, there's not a reasonable likelihood that a uh, permissible vaccine would be available soon, then you're probably permitted to, to take the objectionable vaccine. Um, so, John, uh, now Moderna, 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 Moderna and Pfizer, they use this nanotechnology, technology, right? I mean, don't they kind of introduce these these artificial things that cause proteins that are protein the virus? It's a manufactured mRNA, so it's a new vaccine technology. And so it's like nanites, right? Is it nanites part of that development stage? I'm not, not familiar enough with it to. I don't know if those actually got put in or not. That's Dan and I were talking about that. I don't, I was not sure if they were. I mean, I just read an article about it today trying to get my head around well, the nanotechnology. It wasn't like Bill Gates that wanted to put them in there, but I don't know if they actually are. Well, my understanding was the nanites have something to do with, with the growing along the plant cells or something. So, I mean, it's, it's like an artificial aid to the free production of this protein. So, I mean, it's not like necessarily it's going to be a little computer chip or anything like that, because I don't understand it well enough. But I know that this is like a huge. Uh, it's, it's a medical breakthrough. I mean, I'm not saying it's immoral. I don't think necessarily anybody would necessarily be immoral unless they have some nefarious surface or they cause some kind of damage to human beings. So I just didn't know if you were familiar with that. Uh, not enough to be able to make any statements about it. Um, so what 
So I think that's the, uh, the, the question would be, which vaccine is available? Is there an alternative available? Um, and presumably, unfortunately, this issue is not well enough known that, that you're taking the vaccine is going to cause any type of scandal because very few people know what we're talking about. Right. And now, Bishop Brennan, was it? Bishop Brennan came out, he, he came out but somewhat negative about these vaccines because I, I, he made mention of even in the testing phase or something like that. Yeah. 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 You know, and I, I mean, know that there's always, you know, the, the issue is sufficiently complex, and so you can have more of those who disagree. And so if there's not even to consent, you know, it does kind of go to the point where, you know, you make your best moral choice. So, but Strickland kind of said you shouldn't take the vaccine either. Or? Well, he said that, well, this was a while ago. He said that it was still related in the testing phase. So I didn't read the whole thing because I didn't have time, but he did make a statement about it. I think he was, it was not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the, the prudential judgment then would be, is this also enough related um, that it would, it's, it's not a sufficiently, the disease is not a sufficiently for any reason to take it. I, I think there's no question that, that COVID is a serious disease and that, um, Vaccination may be an important way to prevent it. It's so strange because some people it, it affects just horrifically, and then other people it seems to not affect at all or very little. It's mean, just hard to know. Yeah, I believe, uh, didn't they? I know Bishop Rhodes was part of the committee, didn't they come out and say that uh, those two leading vaccines are ethically permissible? I think they've kind of made a statement already on those two vaccines, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I thought I heard something on Catholic radio say, you know, the Pfizer and Mordana. I think I heard, I heard that, I haven't seen a statement. Yeah, but no, the, the first two seem like the cooperation is sufficiently remote, you know, um, but. And from the Catholic, or the National Catholic Center, it was similar to what you were saying, is like, about the remote, but also like if there's not another option. Correct. Like, um, and at this point, that's why I can give MMRs and chicken poxes and hepatitis vaccines because there is no other option uh, available to protect against those diseases. And I think it's hard too because it's not like we today, we don't know of any other ones that are close to them. Like tomorrow, we could come out of Oh, no, well, it seems like most most, most, most pharmaceuticals aren't really concerned about these ethical issues. No. So it seems. Although it is interesting that I think it was uh, Merck um, that decided to change the uh, the source of one of their polio vaccines from a fetal tissue to a monkey cell. Right. Uh, it may have been a cost decision. It may have been a manufacturing decision. Right. But at least. Uh, it was a good world. They did something right and they did it for the wrong reasons. Right. Um, I don't know if uh, maybe you guys already have listened to this, but back in the early October on that Dr. Doctor program, they interviewed uh, John Gravenstein, who is a vaccine, vaccinologist, epidemiologist. I just re listened to it on my way home from work today. Oh, nice. He was Tremendous, tremendous insight into some of the more details. Father, you might, I think he goes more into detail on how, you know, the certain vaccines are, you know, how they, you know, boost the immune system and how they work. Uh, I think you'd, you'd probably be interested. Um, I mean, they, they had so much information, they couldn't fit it into one show. They had to pop, you know, post a, a bonus uh, podcast. And um, I didn't get time to listen to that one again, but it was very helpful. Um, so I don't know if you guys have listened to it, but it'd be helpful if you haven't. That's just the Dr. Dr. Podcast. Yeah. Yeah. You can just go on wherever you get podcasts and you should, you can look it up. It should, it should be linked on the Redeemer Radio site as well on the Federal Association site. So.
How long ago was that? When did they do that? You said October? October 9th. Yeah. John Gravenstein is the name of the, the guy. Very, very uh, knowledgeable. Great. So, so this will provide us, uh, it's an interesting uh, topic and allows, uh, allows us to uh, explore the, the issue of cooperation, which becomes an issue in many, many other areas of medicine as well. Uh, the, uh, the choice of a physician to prescribe contraceptives, the choice to be involved in other activities, uh, uh, really comes down to how closely we can cooperate with that evil. So it becomes an important principle for us to be um, clear about. Um, I think this is a case where the, uh, if there's no alternative available, the uh, seriousness of the situation would justify uh, using an uh, otherwise illicit vaccine. Um, but it is, uh, if you have a choice or if your organization has a choice, it ought to uh, uh, favor the, the vaccines that have a, an ethical source. So, I mean, what I'm hearing you say, you would take a vaccine if it came out. Yeah, I mean, now if somebody said uh, St. Joe is giving a good vaccine, Memorial is giving uh, an illicit vaccine. Right. Then I would be bound to get the, the one that the St. Joe, that the St. Joe would offer, uh, presenting it as a, a more uh, acceptable source. Right. If they said the only vaccine available uh, in all of northern Indiana is the AstraZeneca one, which has a fetal source, supported fetal source, um, then I think you could be justified if. Uh, the threat of the disease is great enough to be taking the actual vaccine. I'd still be trying to drive to Ohio if they had the one over in Ohio myself. Well, unfortunately, the, the distribution mechanism is going to be so organized yeah. that it's not going to just be drive up vaccine centers. You have to be on a list, uh, at least initially. Yeah. Um, and if you're not on the list and they verify that you have that. Uh, that occupational reason or that medical reason to be on the list, they won't give you the vaccine. So you don't, you don't really have that freedom. And if you're a drug medical staff at St. Joe Med Center, you have to get the vaccine at St. Joe Med Center. You can't go to uh, Elkhart General or Fort Wayne or somewhere else where they have a different vaccine. Yeah, because there's a whole, they have a whole separate tracking system for the COVID vaccine system. But I, I, I'm not sure. So this is, this is all being done through the state health department and military. Yeah. The military, military will have their own system, but they're distributing it. I mean, the military is helping to distribute all these things. So, yeah. so one of the questions that I would uh, throw out to the group is: um, Is this a an opportunity for us to make a statement where um, we would have? a great deal of credibility on a medical standpoint as well as a moral standpoint. I think it would be great, again, like you kind of talked about these quarterly inserts, what a great quarterly insert this would be to get distributed all the bulletins. Write up like a bulletin insert and just gives it gives a great opportunity to, to, to delineate material cooperation and just articulate that well. And I would say, send it out, go through the bishop's office, say, this is from the Catholic Medical Guild and, and probably be good to cooperate with the Fort Wayne side. Yeah. Yeah. Come together and put a multi sensor together that we can just distribute fair wide, no press release. I think it'd be great. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it would at least get the issue onto people's. Uh, right, we're saying, you know, take the vaccine. I mean, it's pretty safe position. It's not like we're saying, don't take the vaccine. I mean, that, that could cause a fire for them, but to heighten and articulate clearly the remote moral cooperation, say, you know, this isn't perfect, but it's listen. I think it's a great opportunity. And, and to say, if you have a choice, right. 
then you have to be cognizant of the moral right. implications of the right. right. I, I think you're great. And obviously, this hot topic would be nice for you to sign and uh, you know, say something that, like, the next meeting, we should have at least a draft. But they might get taxes by the end of the month. Look at uh, the vaccines, if not by Christmas, at least by the end of the month. <coughs> That'd be for your healthcare professionals, but I mean, it's not going to be widely distributed probably until January, February. For that. I don't know. I mean, some of the elderly don't get it. I guess it depends on how many. Depends on how much we get. It. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, the sooner we can get something. Not even great, you know. See if we can come up with a draft and and just talk to Tom and Governor. You know, just you can all do it through email. You know, I mean, that's something. That, I mean, do you have that written out when you kind of present it today, or did you just? Um, what I talked today was just off the cuff. Right. Uh, I've got notes that I've written up in pen. But I mean, you know, again, we want to keep it kind of simple, as simple as we possibly can, and very accessible for people. I'm not blaming them. Right. You know, you know, uh, John, I'm sure you saw that we, I mean, I got an email today from the CMA, National CMA, kind of a press briefing, joint press briefing type statement. It was fairly lengthy. I didn't get a chance. I was at work. I didn't get a chance to read through it. But it, I mean, that's, it was kind of the same deal, but it, that's, <laughs> that's not in layman's terms. It would definitely need to be simplified, but that, that would at least give us, um, something to work with. What's a document you can reference? You know, you can, you got a button over in your document. Sure. Right. But it, was, it looked like it was also from like the, you know, several different organizations, national organizations, a, pediat a pediatric organization, a Christian Medical Dental Association, a CMA, different joint statement from different organizations. Yeah, the, the CMA statement uh, had links at the bottom of it to the pro-life OBGYNs, American College of Pediatricians, CMA, Christian Medical Dental Association. They also linked the Charlotte Moser Institute, which has a nice chart that was updated within the last few weeks, listing all the vaccine options and which ones have uh, connection with sources. The, the CMA statement is probably about two pages long, so it'll be a little long, but it could be distilled and uh, yeah, I, I think it's just if we can distill it and put it something simple and lame terms so that because you know what that, this is something that everybody's interested in. Yeah. It's, a, it's a timely topic. You know, and, and I, I know that, like, for me, you know, I can just download the PDF and I can put it on my parish app, I can put it on my website, and people can link to it. Are, are people even doing bulletins anymore? I do a bulletin, and I print, I print the daily read, I print the, I make it my missile ad, I put the daily read so people can take a bulletin and follow them that. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's what I do with my bulletin. That's the one you take. So that sounds good. I, I've got a lot of talking. Does anybody else have questions or thoughts? I yeah, Benny, you need to unmute you mute yourself, but <laughs> so Megan, everything good? You're muted. Should be doing with kids again. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, I will, uh, why don't I uh, try to uh, put something together sure. and I can send it out um, to everybody who's here and uh, uh, get any feedback from it so you can get something put together on the grade. And I'll try to link up with both names and see if they're doing anything similar. So I think it's something that, you know, and obviously if you look at that bishop statement, if the bishop is on that, we reference that statement as well, okay. you know. If we use his name, he can't not <laughs> support us. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know if any of y'all have downloaded the catalog file for the CMA mentoring app, but I haven't done that yet. What's so, that? So it's like 
um, to connect like it's to connect this like students with other physicians who also like other physicians who other there's chaplains on there too. Um, so my friend from college, he's a, a German college USA, and he's still my students in church. Oh, nice. Dr. Meyer. So he's like, I know there's quite a few people on there, but I know it's probably not of the it's a small amount here that all the same thing so if that's something that you're interested in, download that. The app, I think you sent an email out on how exactly to do it. You have to download the app and that qualify, and then you like sign up for like some kind of thing. But I know I've gotten an email from the CMA on that. It's just on my list of things to do. But it's probably one of the CMA emails, probably. Yeah, it was like a one of the It's one of the national emails. emails. Yeah. Uh, but that's uh, it, it's a good um, to reminder that. Uh, the more than just our, our local community and that uh, we have the opportunity to network, particularly with um, uh, electronics, uh, to network with right. people that, that we can have an impact on um, who are far away from us and, and who can actually be uh, a help to us too. I know I've noticed a lot of students have been asking a lot of questions about like, how people can use kind of Yeah, yeah. But what do I do when my resident tells me to go in and do this? Yeah. No, that's, that's important. Um, our next meeting, um, if we have a meeting the first Wednesday of January, we fall on January 6th, which happens to be the Peace of St. Andre the 7th. And I don't know what uh, COVID will be like at that time, whether it would be uh, appropriate for us to have a mask, but that would be something to at least think of. I am actually out of town that day. Oh, okay. Uh, um, if COVID and everything is a workshop, the St. Paul service, I'm driving out of Texas from J January 4th through the uh, 7th. Oh, nice. But I still might be able to facilitate a Zoom meeting from my hotel down there. Okay. Where in Texas are you? Uh, it's a nice place, some kind of resort place. So, it's, it's, it's in Austin. It's in Austin. What is the place called? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like a nice resort place where it's very, put out by the St. Paul Center. It's very good, solid Catholic thing. Cardinal Burke's involved. And, and I'm not sure if he's going to be at this thing, but we have a, you know, a it's Scott Hahn, Scott, 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 the, uh, yeah, there's going to be some really good speakers there. Uh, I don't think I had any vacation really this year. Probably not. You're trying to take a break. <laughs> well, it's kind of a break. Yeah. <laughs> that was special. <laughs> like I said, this week, yeah, we're recording to probably next week. Right, we can, uh, we can at least, uh, if we look at the next meeting, sure. we can see how things are going closer to then, see whether it needs to be a Zoom meeting, whether it's in person, or if we uh, can find a, another priest and, and have a mass. Sure. Well, I have found a Sunday here, too. I mean, you can certainly, you can certainly do a mass if you want to do a mass. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk with you now and then and see what, what works best. No, that would be great. I mean, we should, you know, almost make that an annual event, really. We was that in our mass for 100 percent over our patron. Right. And if it's canceled, it might be here anyway if they call it off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't have anything, anything else to right. talk about right now, so um, Sit back and my father uh, poses with a prayer. Sure. And just uh, the one thing with all the stress, and you guys see it every day. I mean, I pray all my intercessions. I, I always try and remember all the first responders and medical personnel. I mean, you know, the, the, the staff, and it's just, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of stress. You know, suicides, all these ancillary health care issues, you know. So let's just bring before our Lord and our Lady the concerns and all those people that are in the trenches that are getting discouraged, that are kind of getting worn out, but God give them strength and help them and heal them and bring our world to a greater order. Um, 
I also pray that all corruption be uncovered and those responsible for it, whether they be in the church or outside the ranks, lose their power or be converted so that we can have leaders that respect life, for this liberty and all that's in accord with natural law. And why don't we just play, pray the uh, memorari and content, but you know, that in the end, we, we truly believe that Mary will conquer through her immaculate heart. So we just ask her intercession as we pray. Remember, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone in flood of thy protection, implore thy help, saw thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this conference, I fly into thee, O Virgin, a Virgin, my mother. Ye I come before thee, I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but thy mercy and answer me. Amen. And like I said, I'll try and get this up and running on my website, so it'll be on Father Corman YouTube channel. And if you want to link that to, uh, you know, the end of the set web page. Okay. All right, guys. My well, God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Everybody good for the good of the order here? Um, yeah, did you notice that there's an article in Today's Catholic listed as with today's date that talks about this? What's that? In Today's Catholic, on the web page, there's an article, my husband just pointed it out, December 2nd, 2020. Um, the use of the vaccines is morally acceptable, says the bishops. It came from Washington, D.C., or Washington. So anyway, it's an article that you might want to look at. All right. Thank you so much. We hope I did the same thing they did. Okay. I probably missed that because I was late. All right. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Have a great night. Bye.